a Build Hatch developed production. Hello, I'm Aaron Kyle and welcome to another episode of Build Hatch. On this week's episode, I got to sit down with a genuine down-to-earth building surveyor slash building certifier, Tim Hodges from Urban Certifying. Building surveying, or a principal certifier, this is the kind of role that a lot of people don't realise just how much work these guys do behind the scenes. It's the kind of role that every project needs, however these guys don't get the recognition that other professionals get like an architect or a building designer. Tim's role is a varied one, however essentially these are the guys who make sure that the builders build a quality project and it meets Australian standards or local council guidelines. These guys are an alternative path to taking your building development through your local council. Once again, it was nice to sit down with a family man like Tim and hear about the story behind Urban Certifying. Now let's get into it. Tim from Urban Certifying, welcome to Build Hatch. Thanks, Aaron. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, your business is Urban Certifying. Yep. So for our New South Wales listeners, basically your profession is referred to commonly as Principal Certifying Authority. And then for our Victorian listeners, most commonly referred to as Building Surveyor. Yeah, correct. So there is a bit of a difference in terminology there. All right, Tim, well, like all our guests on Build Hatch, we always start off with your story and take it all the way back to the beginning. So whereabouts did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Kempsey on the mid-north coast. So it's a semi-rural town, um, about 15 k's inland. Um, closest beach, I guess, is yeah, Crescent Head, South West Rocks, where we spend a lot of our time as kids. Great part of the world. Is a great part. I'm a terrible surfer, so I gave that up very early. So for me, it was mostly... Lot of lot of footy and cricket and and knocking about with my mates. Yeah, went to primary school and and high school there, um, and then came here to Newcastle at at eighteen. And what was family life like growing up? Mate, family life was really good. So um, I've got a younger brother and an older sister. Um, both live here in Newcastle now. Mum and dad are still in Kempsey, but do a lot of commuting to say good day. Um, but yeah, pretty simple upbringing um mum was a stay-at-home mum dad just worked at the local council so um yeah that was pretty all so a pretty relaxed sort of coastal lifestyle yeah it was it was if we weren't at the beach um we were out on the family farm if we weren't there it was kids sport really mostly so pretty well how things went for us all right so what did you do out of high school? Like, were you getting a trade or did you want to go to university? What did you sort of come up with? Oh, I never really knew what I wanted to do specifically. Um, as as a child and into my early teen years, um, I always had an interest in working with my hands and doing just odd jobs and construction stuff um, during... So you're more of like a practical person? Yeah, definitely, 100%. Um, my... School holidays were often spent working um, with local tradespeople, just doing a bit of labouring, doing whatever I can to earn some money. And I think I really enjoyed that. I hated the early starts to begin with, but but quickly learnt to like it. Um, so a decision, I never knew whether I was going to go to university or um, pursue a trade. Um, the decision came for me that I was going to leave school at year 10. That's what I decided. My marks came back relatively better, well, a lot better than what I anticipated. So I thought, oh, I better stick it out and, and go again. Finished year 11, got to the first week of year 12 and went, no, nah, I can't do this. This isn't for me. <laughs> this is not where I want to be. So I got on the phone, rang around like a lot of local builders and then started a carpentry apprenticeship. And what was that like? Was that pretty easy to get or was it difficult? How did you actually... At the time, it was actually quite... It was quite easy, to be honest. I... Few, it was absolute cold calls, calling people up. A few guys were interested, a few weren't. Got an interview with a fairly large builder that mainly does commercial projects. They, I called on a Thursday. They said, come in Monday, have an interview. Sat down with one of the directors um, and had a really good chat. wasn't long after that he sort of shook my hand and said, well, we're interested in offering a position. Do you want to come and um, finish the year off just doing a bit of work experience? And if all goes well, you can start your trade. In the new year you mentioned cold calling so cold calling where did you come up with the concept like was that just a natural thing for you to do to show some initiative and 
get the phone out and dial some numbers or did somebody tell you that or was that sort of just I, natural? So to take a step back, when I wanted to, to leave school, mum and dad basically said, you, we're not going to let you leave school until you've got a full-time job. We don't mind if it's a trade or, or anything really. It's just got to be full-time. So I went to an employer first at the time where I was currently working in a retail shop and, and asked him if he had any more hours and he quickly said, no, like this is all we have for you. So the next step for me was, well, I think I'm going to pursue a trade career. And I sat down on the Thursday, as I said, and opened up the phone book and went from top to bottom and just just cold call. I, I don't know to this day what led me to that decision. It was more though, more to the point that I had to do something. So And, it, and it's crazy that we find that a little bit unusual, isn't it, to actually show that initiative and look up the phone book and dial some numbers and reach out and say, hey, I'm Tim, I'm looking for some work, you know? like Yeah, it's probably something that comes natural to me to a degree. I'm not afraid just to to either approach someone or ring someone up and start a conversation or, or be pretty blunt to the point to say, hey, I'm looking for a job, but what are the chances? Do we want to catch up? So in Kemp to use a small town, it, it's not it's highly unlikely that there's not someone there that knows who you are or knows your family anyway. So it was more just let's just do a shot in the dark and, and see who who's interested and who wants to sit down with me and, and hear what I have to say. So that was, what, a three-year or four-year apprenticeship? Yeah, so it was a... It ended up being a three and a half year apprenticeship. So a carpentry trade's four years. Um, you do three years, both with an on-site and one day a week sort of TAFE um, component. And then your final year is just, just on the tools. Um, I got halfway through my final year and basically my employer um, wanted to not move me on, but progress me within their company. So um, we started the process to, to finish up that apprenticeship halfway through my fourth year. So you obviously showed some initiative and they saw some talent there with Tim and trying to progress you on. Yeah, the work we were in was was mostly commercial, um, more to the point just government projects, so schools, TAFE colleges, um, hospitals and the like. So there was a huge component of supervision and looking after other trades and, and owning your element of, the, of that particular job. So very early on I sort of was interested in doing that role more than having a nail bag on 100% of the time. So so after working as a chippy for a while, what did you do after that? So while I was going through my apprenticeship, because the company I worked for did a lot of commercial projects, um, a lot of government work, schools and hospitals, a large component of, of their role as the overall builder was doing a lot of project management and, and supervision on the site. Um, I got a taste of that early, probably from my second year onwards, you know, just taking ownership of certain things. And I, I really liked that more than wearing a nail bag 100% of the time. So when I showed that initiative and, and spoke to them that that was I was interested in, they sort of took you under the, their wing to a degree and, and got to learn that component more. That was definitely part of the role of finishing up my trade as early as I could to get me out of that apprenticeship phase and then push me more into a um, leading hand site foreman yeah, okay. arrangement. Yeah. So after that, I guess, what led you into eventually working as a principal certifier? It was interesting. I, I did. I worked for that company for almost 11 years, so I did, did my apprenticeship, moved into leading hand site management roles um, on varying scales of of projects, you know, some of the large ones are up to sort of fifteen million, the smaller ones a couple of hundred thousand, depending on what you were doing. So So that's important for anyone listening to this. You were exposed to that different variety of projects from small ones to larger ones. Yeah, absolutely. That the scale was, you know, moving a demandable into a club into a schoolyard to for the overflow of students to, you know, building a rather large nursing home. So yeah, the the different methods of construction and different trades and volume of trades on like on the site at any one time was was very vast so you got a very well-rounded experience um i guess the tipping point for me is with that role you never work in the same place so whilst um, i base myself here in newcastle you're working anywhere in new south wales at any one time you do that for long enough and look some people thrive on it don't get me wrong but i grew tired of it Still loved the job and loved the role, but just was looking for something closer to home. Um, so I did look around and try and see 
if there were companies of a similar structure that I could move into and stay local. But as you know, it's mostly the same role everywhere you go to. That's right. Um, so a chance meeting um, through a mutual friend had me across the table like we are now over a beer um, talking to a, a private certifier that does uh, principal certifying authority roles. And funnily enough, he was at the stage of like, I'm looking to put someone on. I didn't know too much about the role. A lot of our stuff, because it was government work, we were sheltered from private certifiers. It's all crown sort of development. So you didn't completely understand the role, but he explained to me about, you know, you're undertaking inspections and exercising certain functions. I thought, look, I can do this. Um, so me just being all in like I always was, turned around to my old employer and gave them my notice. Um, before I actually had a job anywhere else. You just took the, this guy. took the gamble. Oh, I think I had to. Yeah. Um, I've, all, I've just got to be all in or, or nothing. I can't sit on the fence on too many things. So I gave them my notice to say, look, I'm going to move on and pursue something else, um, which they, were, they weren't super happy about, but they understood why I wanted to make the change. So um, I did that. I had long service leave up, up my sleeve, so I took some time off and started working uh, I kept persisting with this gentleman and then he went, look, come and see me at the end of January. I'll, I'll give you two days a week and we'll go from there. So that's pretty well how this process started for me. We met through a mutual friend um, and once I basically didn't really give him an option at the end of the day, I said, look, mate, I've, I've left my previous job. I'm ready to go whenever you are. So we started on a pretty well a trial basis of a, of a couple of days a week just to so I could learn the ropes, understand if this was really something I wanted to do. All right, so I have to ask, what is the main difference for those that are listening to this who think, what does a principal certifier do or what's principal certifying authority? What does it mean? What, what are the two main differences between those two roles? So I guess our name, our roles change a lot as well. We've, we've regis- recently gone through a phase where We were accredited certifiers and then an accredited certifier could be a principal certifying authority. That's recently been adjusted to registered certifiers and now just a principal certifier. So essentially the accredited certifier issues the permit, so the the construction certificate, um, and has done all those relevant checks. And then the principal certifier or the principal certifying authority then takes on the statutory role of taking them through the build whether that be the mandatory critical stage inspections, you know, making sure all those compliance uh, issues and, and items are actually met during the build. So, you know, almost 100% of the time, you're, those methods are one and the same. Like yes. you're the registered certifier and the principal certifier at the same time. But there are instances where I may issue a permit for a job and get them to, say, a construction certificate approval. And this happens a lot where I have clients that are, you know, the design team might be based locally, but the job's quite remote. We're all still take them through the approval process, give them a construction certificate, but then someone local might take the, the role of the principal certifier on and take them through the inspections, through to the occupation through the certificate. But a lot of the time it's this one in the same role. What does your role basically entail? Um, our role is it's varied, but essentially we are an alternative to the local council. So we can exercise functions similar to a council without the full enforcement powers. So basically if someone has a renovation or a new home, it could be any sort of project at home that basically would typically require council approval, they then need to apply for New South Wales. It's basically a development application or a DA as it's commonly referred to. In Victoria, it's a a permit. Either way, it's basically a permit that gives you something from council to say you can now go ahead and and build it. And where your role comes in is basically taking that DA or permit that you've got at planning stage and then executing it so that you now have something that you can build on site in accordance with Australian standards in the building code. Is that basically a good summary? Yeah, in a nutshell it is. Um, I always like to say to people, in New South Wales, we have two approval pathways. There's the traditional development application that you get, and then once that's received from council, you have the opportunity to stay with council or go to a private certifier to do the construction certificate. Um, Or the second pathway is under New South Wales legislation, we've got some policies that allow for complying development 
which is basically a fast track method. If your proposed works fits within these develop, you know, certain development guidelines, we can approve that as a private certified without the need for council as well. And and to do that basically by bypassing your local council in that in that instance, the planning instruments or the the local guidelines for complying development consent is a little bit more relaxed in a way that you can't really push the envelope with, say, different building heights. So you can't really go down the same path, can you, and, and expect the same result. Like if you go down complying development, you have to really stick within a tighter circle, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. You, you have to fit every criteria of that environmental planning instrument that you choose to use. So there's, there's prescribed heights, there's pres- um, prescribed setbacks, floor areas, amount of landscaping you, you have. And, and if you don't tick every single box in, of that piece of legislation, yeah, you, you do need to, to go into the development application process where you can work within local council's de- development control plans and potentially apply for variations of those if you want to work outside of, of that plan. But compliant development is a very uh, straightforward method. Um, if you can sh- determine that it will, if I can determine that that proposal meets all the criteria, I can approve it as compliant development, yeah. And your role has an interesting history because historically all of this work was done in-house with local governments and councils. And then as councils, I guess, became bogged down with waiting lists and if I'm a hungry developer property developer I don't have time because time is money so I need to get my all of my complying development or get my construction certificate or my permits in place I don't have time to muck around so that's where I come to you as urban certifying where I can bypass council and use your firm to ensure my project complies with all of the Australian standards and building code of Australia and basically get a some sort of permit to then go ahead and, and build my project yeah correct so if we basically once you get past that that planning stage whether it be a development application with the council or a compliant development certificate the next phase after that is that construction phase the role for me from there is much the same I'll, i will go through and assess everything to make sure it, it meets um, development consent conditions any applicable australian standards you know the ncc so the, the building code of australia that we work under and then make sure certain other requirements are met under the Home Building Act, et cetera, and then I can allow you to commence work. And then once you commence, I can then take you through um, the required critical stage inspections um, under the EPNA Act to inspect the work at various stages. And that might be you know, before concrete slab is poured and then typically it's after that frame inspection. Yeah, typically it, there's, you know, before any footings and slabs are poured, then we'll look to perform a frame inspection. We look at the all internal waterproofing, um, stormwater drainage connections. Um, it, it does vary depending on the size and scope of your project, but there are prescribed critical stage inspection points where we, we come in and um, make sure things are being constructed correctly. Yeah, I, th- I think with class one to 10, where you're dealing with that residential market, you are very much connected to the homeowner and and the actual uses of the building as such. I really enjoyed that role, talking to the the end users of the product all the time, dealing with them, trying to... A lot of the time, it's the first time they've ever ever gone through this process, so they have lots of questions, they've got lots of fears, lots of anxieties, but you sort of hold their hand to a degree and, and take them through that process, which I think I enjoy the most out of any part of my role, is to see them going from the initial phone call when they ring you and say, this is the first time we've done this and we don't know what we're doing, like, can you please help us to get into the end where they've moved in, it, it's all settled down and then they turn around and just have nothing but gratitude for, for taking them through what is the biggest, ex- potentially the big, biggest experience of their life. So and quite a rewarding part of my job. And I, I think you're right in that it is so important that a lot of the, the people that are renovating who don't think that, need certain approvals for a large deck or an add-on to the back of the house or something like that. So it is important to have that role where you are feeding some knowledge into the homeowner to say, well, look, you can't actually do that or there's ways and means of doing it, but we need to tick the boxes. Yeah, correct. 
and that and that goes back. I mean, I I remember working with a local council for for a project that I was working on in my former life as a builder, and I remember this guy had a had a nickname because he was with council, and his nickname was Inspector Gadget because because this guy would come to site, and he was at the time perceived as painfully slow and absolutely anal with everything and just everything had to be ticked looking back in hindsight at the time his role actually was a benefit to me and i'm lucky that i did have that attitude at the time of oh this guy's a nice guy you know i don't take it personally when he says you haven't got enough steel cover with your concrete um or different things haven't been secured where they should have been secured now as a builder you can't help but at the time you're thinking oh, this is just a hassle you know I've got a pour on this afternoon I've got an hour and a half well whose fault is that in reflection that's actually my fault or the builder's fault at the time whereas I think it's important to have that perception of you're not there to be a pain in the ass or a sheriff you're there to actually make sure that the building is built in accordance with relevant standards. So it's actually a healthy thing to have a fresh set of eyes, not to mention that you have to be there, of course, but I'm just saying to open your eyes up and say, well, you're a, a service that we need to, to make us a better industry as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of the time um, those relationships that you talk about are, are very dynamic and, and initially when you meet people for the first time, you might come across that way. They'll be like, oh, here comes this bloke. He's just here to cause trouble, slow our job down, you know. And you sit, you explain to them why you're here, what you're trying to do. And they just do realise you're just doing your job just just like they are and you're there to assist them at the end of the day. Whilst there's times where you need to take the hard line approach and go, no, this criteria has to be met. But I always like to break it down to this is why, this is why we need to do it. And, and they do generally come around and say yeah we get what you're talking about like we appreciate you stopping by and that for me fosters and develops that relationship further and further so so that initial foundation of setting that i guess the building the relationship and setting that standard that they know um what you're like how you treat them they treat you back the same way and you develop that respect together i think is really important um have you ever had a guy like a hard-ass builder just like just yeah make it extreme and definitely just be ruthless oh they do of course like you, you always get the questions if, if i'm freshly shaven i probably look like i'm 16 years <laughs> old and i turn up to site and, and tell them that his reinforcement's wrong or the framing member's not right and first thing they do is look you up and down and go how old are you again where are you from you know and, I, and it's, it's really a tough for role me. mate like i honestly as i said it's a tough role like i, I think so oh but i enjoy that sort of feedback yeah, and comments from you, people. you've got clearly the personality to to have that and oh you do head, you know yeah, yeah. oh look I, I give it back as good as i get it but you also <laughs> explain them that look a lot of the time i've probably been in the industry longer than they have as well i think mate i don't think you understand like i've been doing this now for almost 18 years i know exactly what i'm talking about like, yeah. whilst the role of certification for me has only been the last seven years or so prior to that like i was full-time with an owl bag on inspecting these guys looking after you guys on from the other side of the fence on the construction side but um and they do realise that and, and settle down, but no, I love that part of the job. It's good. Yeah, good, it is good, good. fun. Yeah, well, I think it's character building. It is. It really is. So, and quickly they they change their opinion of you. You go from oh, here's this, you know, person that's going to make my life hard to, you know, this guy. It's almost my best mate to a degree because he's helping me through this process as well. He's picking up on things that we may have missed because you get professional blinkers on. You, you know, do doing things all the tunnel time. vision. You know, particularly with concrete, yeah, and particularly with framing, they're the they're the critical. They you know, are, the, yeah, the big ones, and I think it's it's really at the end of the day like a it's a health check, an independent person coming onto site, making sure the boxes are ticked. Yeah, absolutely. And look, there's times where certain framing elements even go outside my scope of knowledge. So we work within the timber framing code, but as soon as things are to you know you use. We use the Australian standard like um, AS 1684, that, that series a lot that we're well versed in and know inside and out. But when things move to certain LVL framing members and, and you start using the um, AS 1170 series, 
that's where it sort of tips above my knowledge and we get structural engineers involved again. So there's even times where I'll turn up to site and things are outside of the scope of the framing code and I'll have to explain to them, look, we'll need to get someone else involved to perform, to inspect this part of the work. Doesn't always go down well because it's, you know, more money coming out of the homeowner's pocket pocket at the end of the day. But once you sit down and explain, look, these are the reasons why and we're all working together for the common goal to to get this structure you know, safe and, and fit for purpose. So, you know, this is your family home at the end of the day or, or whatever the case may be. Um, they eventually come around and understand, you know, I, your point of view and, your, and, and the particular role that I play. Yeah. And I, I think that's a critical ingredient. It's it's not about just going to site and saying, well, look, this doesn't comply because of X, Y, or Z. It's actually about looking at the whole project in its entirety and saying, well, look, if you do this solution then that ticks the box. And so it's coming up with practical solutions. Yeah, correct. A, a lot of the, your time out on site is not just saying yes or no, that works, that doesn't, is, is working with them on getting the result or finding the solution that they need uh, to progress, absolutely. How many phone calls have you had from a builder where they've poured the slab and you haven't been there to inspect it prior? Surprisingly not that common. You get it every That's now and again. Yeah, I think... I think we've been around long enough now and this process has been around long enough now that it's a very, very rare occurrence. Um, when it does happen, the bad side is the legislation doesn't allow you to progress anymore to an occupation certificate. So you do everything you can to assist people. A lot of the time there there are there is another pathway once that has taken place and you just you just help them along that pathway. And it's really around it sort of statutory declarations and it is to a like degree that. and you can go down and, and make building certificate applications with the local council where they want certain information but it's it is, a hard process for a reason y- yeah it i think it's designed as a hard pro- um process for exactly as you say for that reason because the idea is to, to <laughs> get the permit happening. in place first <laughs> get the inspections done at prescribed times before moving on and uh, look I think there's ways to minimise that as well. Even from my role is to minimise that by giving very clear instructions of this is when I want to come, this is why you detail it in a list. Yeah, A lot of the time if I haven't heard from someone for a little while, I will check in and go, G'day guys, how you going? What stage are you up to? Do you need me yet? And and they might, a lot of the time it'll trigger things. I couldn't tell you how many times where they go, oh shit, yeah, we, we actually need you tomorrow. Like, can, we, can you squeeze us in to come and have a look at it? And you do everything you can to do that. But a lot of the time it's I try and stay really proactive in my role to either identify things that might cause a problem, you know, in the future or just touching bases with guys that I haven't heard from for a little while. I think that's an important note to make because I don't think you can get that flexibility with, say, dealing with your local council. Um, I think with, with council you kind of need to be very proactive as a builder you need to have a very reliable schedule. And so you could call up council and say, look, today's Tuesday. I'd like you to have an inspection on Friday. Whereas if you don't make that deadline and suddenly you're calling up and saying, look, I need you Monday now. We, we, we didn't make that deadline. It's a little bit less flexible. Whereas with you guys, it's going down that path of the private certification. I guess you're able to be proactive and it's, hey, Tim, I forgot to call you yesterday. We've got a pour at 9 o'clock in the morning. Can you get here? And you can kind of fit in with him. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very important part, particularly just in our business alone. We, we try and be very proactive but also reactive to people's needs as well. Um, I think that's one of the core focuses of our business is to help people out as much as we can and take them through the process but also be reactive to what people need, offer that flexibility that they may not get anywhere else. There's times where if you're, you're booked solid, you may not be able to get there exactly when they need you to, but you still work with them and they understand that. Like You build those relationships, as I said, and, and they might say, look, I, we want to pour at 9 o'clock and you get here and you're like, oh, look, I, I can't get there before 9, but if you can you know, hold it off till 9.30, I can definitely be there. Like I'll squeeze you in because you do everything you can for, for, for people to help out. And then normally you know, very responsive to that and, and, and appreciative. And I think that. that comes down to your prior practical experience too, working in large construction projects and small ones, of course, but 
having that adaptability and and realizing and recognizing what goes on on a construction site and trying to fit in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that at times gives you that point of difference between you know us and council, us and even some larger certification uh, firms where they they may not necessarily have that flexibility as well, just due to their corporate structure. We are small for a reason. We take on only a certain amount of work per year for a reason to allow that, I guess, more reactive service shall people need it, but also be proactive and, and contact them and see whether they need assistance as well. Now, urban certifying, how did that begin? It was an interesting time. It was, wasn't was something that we had on the horizon for a long point of time, a circumstance arise where we just looked at each other one day and went, you know what, well, been doing it long enough now for other people and the way we liked to do things or wanted to do things was different to how things were being done elsewhere. So the only way to do that was to, to work for ourselves. Again, like everything, you just jump in with two feet and, 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 and we started it. So we started Urban Certifying in August of 2018. Okay, yeah. so a couple of years ago. Yeah. The decision to jump was for, for the reasons as, it, as I described and when we, when we took the leap, you know, you have contacts from working with people and people obviously know your name because as a principal certifying authority, a lot of the times whilst you work for another company, you're still the individual certifier for their for their job. So people will know you by your name rather than the company name you Correct. work for. And so you, I guess, legally you have a, a statutory liability under the legislation as yourself. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So when, because of that, people know you by your name, um, it doesn't take long for people to ask where you are, where have you been, and they certainly the days of social media, you can look someone up pretty quickly and find out where they've landed. Um, so that sort of helped generate business for us to begin with. Yeah, we certainly didn't we didn't jump with any you know people to take with us or or, or projects in mind. It was sort of made the announcement, you know, put some social media posts up to say, hey, I've moved here, I am and waited for phone calls to arrive. <laughs> and that was the beginning. Obviously, there was more to it from that to, to build more business and get more projects, but that's what, what we did to begin with to kick off. And so how did you actually do that? Did you sort of pound the pavement or, again, get the phone book out? Or phone, I, book, phone books are out I now. Went back oh, to the, they're still there. They're still around. They're still there. I, I went back to my old method and cold call. I We, we put some social media posts up and, and just said, look, we've – I've gone out on my own. This is my company name now. This is how to find me. And and that generated some leads, of course. And then um, other than that, I went back to good old cold calling. I ran companies I haven't worked with before, ones that you know of, ones you don't know, ones that you think we could be a good fit based on what you've seen and what you've heard and just made those conversations. And, you know, I'm a firm believer of if you ring at the right time, someone might be sitting there unhappy with their current service and you just happen to jump on the phone and they answer and they go, Actually, I was actually thinking about ringing a different private certifier. Why don't you come in and say good day? Or, and it works. I'm, I'm an absolute believer of that, and it's always worked for me in the past. So generally, that's that's all we did, and that it just snowballs from there. People see your signs out on fences. People, you know, we don't advertise. We don't do. We don't have a big social media presence. We don't do anything like that. It, it's purely good old fashioned building relationships, people saying, having good things to say about, you know, the old word of mouth. And that's, that's practically what we've built this on. Well, it's funny you say that. And, and uh, the people that listen to this show every single week probably get sick of me saying it, but mm. I bring it up just about every week because it's still relevant. Even sitting down, talking to you, word of mouth marketing. It's good old-fashioned relationships. And who knows, maybe we are having a bit of a shift at the moment with the COVID world and everything else. Maybe that's it, or maybe maybe people just forgot about these good old fashioned traditional relationships and the importance of saying hello and reaching out and saying, "Hey, this is what I'm doing. How are you going? If you need some help in future, because all it takes is someone to say, "Oh, I've got this project. Yeah, we're about to go through approval," um, or "Geez, we finally got it. It was in council for six months." Oh. I know Tim from Urban Certifying. He's a you know great certifier. You should give him a call. So that's exactly how it works. It, it is exactly how it works, and it, it's 
almost exclusively how it works for our business. We, you know, sitting here waiting, sitting here today, I would have got three phone calls alone that was purely just, G'day, mate, we've got your name from such and such. We're looking to do this. Just wondering if you want to take a look at it for us. And and those people might be previous clients that I've worked with or a colleague in the industry that we've worked with before. Or, and that's ultimately how all our business comes through. So I like to keep it that way. We're not, we're not trying to, you know, be the biggest at all by any means. We're just trying to offer the service we want to provide how we want to provide it um, and give people that really good experience. So when you went out on your own, what, what were your goals back then? Pay the mortgage. <laughs> like, honestly, that was it. And, and that's probably still the goals today. Like, we, I grew up very simply and I still keep that philosophy now in my, in my current life. So um, the goals were just to be, be flexible in our work environment. So we, we've got two young kids, so being able to at times work alternate hours or, or work into the evening because something's on during the day or especially, you know, before and after school was important to us. So I think that was part of the initial drive to do it. Um, but in terms of out-and-out out goals, we honestly didn't set any. It was just, all right, let's do this. We're going to have a go. We're going to give it a red-hot crack. We're going to do the best we can because this is how we want to do things and we'll see where that takes us. And that's purely all we had on the horizon at the time. Yeah, that's inspiring. It just keeps steamrolling. Yeah, it has been. I think for us, we've gone on a continual progression. Um, we'd be at the stage where the growth to a degree stops for us until we're ready to take that next stage and, and bring on employees and, and get them into the same philosophy we have because that's really important um, for us. So that will probably be the next natural step Um to, to ensure future growth is to yeah get some employees on board. So on that, who do you talk to when thinking about making those big decisions like that, about putting on more employees? For me, um, I've got a really vast and wide network of people that I talk to every single day and people come to me for advice as well. Like it's a really good group of, of different types of people as well. So not just people in the building and construction industry, like a lot of our initial support to make the leap came from people in other industries like other business people that just said just go out there and do it so a lot of the times I, I do lean on them about you know what should be the tipping point of a threshold to put someone else on or or why we're making the right decisions to go down this pathway I do rely on people a lot I don't I'll put my hand up and say I don't have the best business brain I don't think I have one at all really I just know how to treat a person how they need to be treated I know how to do my job really well so I've been sort of flying on that philosophy at, at, at the minute. Um, but when I do need assistance, I sort of just reach out to close family and friends that have got a lot more experience and have been through a lot of things as well, and they sort of guide me to a degree. I'm, I'm pretty stubborn at times and big-headed, and a lot of the times I will probably ultimately make my own decision, but I do lean on that experience a lot. I think that's important too because since releasing this podcast, I've – uh, particularly in the last few weeks, had quite a few people reach out to say, look, hey, can we catch up? Do you do any mentoring or coaching or things like that? And a lot of people know their particular trade or and just from talking to different people and trying to give them advice from my, my practical and my, my legal background as well. But also I think it's a case of you know your your trade, like you know your bread and butter, it's what you do, but it's having that conversation and cross check and it kind of helps make sure you're on the same page even though you might be 99.9 percent .9 certain it's having that honest conversation getting that different perspective more more or less reassurance yeah absolutely and and that's a big part of i think most parts of my role as well because a lot of the times even we'll go to not just on the business side of things, but just on our own, how we make decision makings, how we interpret legislation, things like that. You want to make sure you're getting that right. And a lot of the time we, you know, you talk to colleagues and, and see if they interpret things the same way. And a lot of the time pre-COVID, we'd sit down a lot, um, being part of professional organisations, you'd sit down in a big room to a training seminar and you'd a lot of guys would ask questions. And a lot of the time you leave there feeling quite good because you go, well, the guy's actually 
they're all on the same wavelength. We're all interpreting things the same way. We all have the same questions. Like we're all and you're having well similar problems together. as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, it's as you say, you're always not you know generally ninety nine percent there, but it's just to get that reassurance, get that feedback, get another opinion that sort of helps you along the way a lot. I, I call it a, a health check. Yeah, absolutely. Now. You're a family business. You have your lovely wife, Ree, who helps work in your business. So what's that like, having a family business? It, it's challenging, but it's really good. Ree and I have a great relationship where we can either have an agreement or disagreement in the, in the business side of things, but, but learn to turn that off and go back to, to family Put life. So business or family hat on? They're two very different hats, aren't they? They have to be. I think initially those lines blurred at, at, at times and you take frustrations of your day into your home life and you quickly learn that's that's not going to work long term. So you, you learn to take one hat off, put the other one on and then just yeah, continue about your, your day. It is hard to switch off sometimes as well, particularly when you're under the pump or you've got deadlines to meet. So Absolutely. That's probably... One of the toughest parts of the job is learning when to switch off and and like when's the appropriate time to switch off that you, you need to now and then a lot of the time I'll, I'll I'll switch off you know early evening five six p.m. have that family time and then kids go to bed and you and you switch it back on again and you're back into it for the last few hours just to um yeah meet certain deadlines or or stay on top of projects that you you want to keep an eye on closely. If anyone's listening to this who's sort of thinking about look. I wouldn't mind going down the same path that you're doing. What's actually involved? What, what's the actual process to become a certifier? The process is very depending on what pathway. They do give a lot of um, pathways for registration currently. So my pathway was coming through a, a, a trade background first and then you do a more, I guess, an, educate, an education component in building surveying and, and that's one pathway and then others will go through the do it as a university degree whether it's a construction management degree first with the building surveying component um, or graduate certificates in building surveying as well so there are two distinct pathways that you can take sometimes they cross over depending on what level of registration you want to achieve um, i personally think the pathway i followed works quite well because you're coming in with a lot of industry knowledge a lot of construction like you know hands-on technical knowledge um, yeah, it really works, I find. I think coming into your role without that practical experience would be a big challenge. It can be. I've mentored um, younger certifiers in the past that have come through without that practical knowledge and, and you're trying to instill that in them. And it can be difficult when you go to site and, and you come up against a you know a concrete near retirement that's seen everything <laughs> and he sees a, a 20-year-old that that's fresh you. out of uni. And look, it, it, it's a challenging part of a role that really is and... I've, as I said, I've mentored people through that. And I don't think there's a right or wrong way to approach how you want to get into it. But I think it certainly helps if you can go onto site, you know, with that experience, how they're going to treat you, how to treat them back and, and certainly talk the talk at times. It helps. Now, I've probably been to at least five legal events or presentations or seminars where lacrosse, which is the landmark case in a nutshell cladding being non-compliant caught fire is an absolute disaster so i won't go over that particular case but how has lacrosse which i guess has had massive impacts right across this whole country on compliance and even down to the the builder that's putting or installing that particular cladding on how is that particular case affected your business with insurance and compliance and everything else the spotlight it's put on it has been pretty pretty interesting and it's been sort of difficult times for us a lot because i think the construction industry of the whole um being a design team being the construction team and even the certification side you know inspector role engineers have all been been placed under pretty tight and close scrutiny um a lot of the times our role has been questioned of, of whether we're able to exercise our functions properly being in a private sector rather than within the council. Um, and to go back to what you've said, it's, it, it's played a huge role in... in The compliance side of things has yeah. just been huge. So there's all sorts of indemnities 
yes. around signing off on on various cladding types and things like that. And and it's a really tricky problem because at the end of the day, I guess as as the building designer and as the building certifier, I, I actually resonate with both of those roles in the construction process because you're almost relying on a cladding. If a, if, if a new type of cladding comes onto the market, you rightfully assume that that product ticks all the boxes. So if it's been incorporated and it comes onto the market and you feature that into the design of your project, well, rightfully so, as I said, you, you kind of tend to think, well, it's an it's a an assumption that that product's actually approved, whereas you can't do that now. Now it's you have to almost do your own research and make sure that it has a compliance certificate and your insurance for professional indemnity insurance. They're making you jump through these extra hoops that you didn't have to. Oh, absolutely. The days where you could assume that anything is correct or right just because it's it's been imported into the country or it's been specified on other projects are. Uh, are completely gone and they have been for some time but the it really highlights how much we have to be critical of every piece of information we've given we've got to do our own research we've got to look at um you know certificates that come through whether they've you know we, we have a, there's requirements here in australia where products can get certified by strength building codes board there's a few different processes there where a product can say it conforms with all the requirements and a lot of the time they're probably the products that people should lean to first, but that's not always the case. So, you know, I will admit in my residential, in our sector that we work in, we're somewhat immune to combustible or non-combustible cladding issues, but the fallout is still the same for all of us. Like professional indemnity is, is tighter than ever. We've seen increases of, you know, premiums. Ours was 450% over the last 12 months and we don't even work in that space. So... It's, it's affected everyone, hasn't it? It definitely has, and, it, and that only ends up affecting the consumer as well because we can't wear all of those costs and then and fees get pushed up and people ask, last year you charged this, this year you're charging this. Like, that's a significant increase. Like, like what's going on? And you do have to explain to them that, look, we just have to pass on costs. That's um, right. Now, Tim, the certifier, when you're not certifying or working in construction land, what, what do you like to do outside of work? At the moment, there's not a lot of time for much else, I'll be honest. Like I talked about the balance at the start and we, we're getting that wrong currently. But um, It's hard to stop. It is, it is, and I do enjoy the role as well, so I get lost in it a lot. I can put my head down and, and lose a lot of time and wake up. and it, Oh, not wake up, but put my head up and it's 2.30 in the morning and go, geez, I better get to bed. But um, outside of that, I like to do a lot of family time with the kids, um, whether that be coaching kids' sport, um, I really enjoy that, getting involved, try and be as hands-on as I can with that. Outside of that, it's, you know, catching up with mates where you can, still playing, um, just playing sports when I can, still actively involved in the cricket community here in Newcastle, so I try and do that as much as I can. Um, it's generally it, to be honest. So, it's, yeah, it's family, life, it's family life and then getting out and trying to be active are probably the two things outside of urban certifying at the moment. So you're based in Newcastle. Whereabouts do you work across, like, different regions or outside of Newcastle? Um, mostly within Newcastle and the Hunter area. So Newcastle, Maitland, uh, Port Stephens, Sessonk, those sorts of areas like Lake Macquarie. That's our core sort of work. We, we can offer services in other council areas. A lot of it's dependent on whether we can get there for inspections or whether we take a job on or not. Um, as we touched on earlier, there, there are times where I can still issue permits for a job in a different geographical location and they use someone local with boots on the ground to perform the PCA role, but I can still be the accredited certifier. But so you can still sign off on the complying development side? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we're only restricted to everywhere within New South Wales under the accreditation scheme that, that we have, but for to exercise the functions of the principal certifier, um, we try to work as as likely as we can so yeah typically just yeah the hunter region mostly so tim you're our first certifier or building surveyor on our, on build hatch you're a very practical person i think you could easily have a lot of good rapport with tough builders or tough concreters so i think that's important and clearly just by sitting here speaking with you today you've got those qualities where you can have that rapport with a concreter or a builder and and uh, it's a pleasure to see. So I think that's an extremely great trait to have. 
and clearly you have it. So congratulations on Urban Certifying and thank you for coming on to Build Hatch. Thank you very much. It's, I've had a really good time and it's a pleasure. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Build Hatch. You got to hear about Tim's journey in establishing Urban Certifying. As you can tell by my conversation with Tim, Tim is a very practical person and is passionate about his business in achieving practical solutions. As usual, please check out our Instagram where you can see our guests and some behind-the-scenes information. And if you'd like to reach out or throw some ideas around, please feel free to get into contact with me. I've certainly had plenty of people doing that lately during these tough times. Have a great week and you'll hear me again on the airwaves next week. Thanks for listening to another episode of Build Hatch. You have experienced a Build Hatch developed production.